everyone. Welcome to the Children's Policy Centre webinar series. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, the traditional custodians on the land on which I live and work, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, who have never ceded sovereignty and remain strong in their enduring connection to land and culture. I'd also like to extend my respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people here today. I'm Angie Bexley, Deputy Director of the Children's Policy Centre, which is based at the Crawford School of Public Policy at the Australian National University. With Director Professor Sharon Bessel, the Children's Policy Centre undertakes innovative interdisciplinary research on a range of issues relating to children's policy. We seek to connect researchers, policymakers and practitioners working on a range of issues to promote the human rights, well-being and best interests of children. And we aim to communicate the findings of our research and others with those who matter. Today's event coincides with National Families Week and it's in partnership with the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, Anti-Poverty Week and Social Ventures Australia, who we thank for their collaboration and willingness to be part of this critical conversation today. And we're also delighted to have with us Dina Bowman from Brotherhood of St Lawrence, Tony Wren from Anti-Poverty Week and Emma Sydneyham from Social, Ve Social Ventures Australia sitting with us here on the panel today. This year's federal budget has been described as a value statement and the ways in which families and children living in poverty are spoken about or not spoken about tells us the ways in which we value them. And while the moves outlined the women's budget, looking at economic security, health and the social policy issue with childcare have been welcomed, economic recovery and workforce, workforce participation is only one part of the puzzle. Does this year's budget go far enough to make meaningful, transformational and sustainable change for children and their families living in poverty? Is this year's budget the reform we need to deliver a prosperous and inclusive economy for all Australians? With us here today are four fabulous speakers to share with us their own reflections and analysis on the 2021-2022 budget and what it means for tackling child and family poverty. Thank you all for joining us here today. We have a fabulous lineup, starting with Sharon Vessel, who is a Professor of Public Policy here at the Crawford School of Public Policy, where she's Director of our Children's Policy Centre and Poverty and Inequality Research Centre. Her research focus on, focuses on addressing multi-dimensional poverty and inequality, particularly for children. We also have Miranda Stewart. Hi, Miranda, who is Professor of Law at the University of Law, uh, uh, sorry, at the University of Melbourne Law School and Honorary Professor at the Tax and Transfer Policy Institute here at the Crawford School of Public Policy. Miranda's work focuses on tax, welfare and gender budget policy. Catherine Little, hi Catherine, is CEO of SNAKE, the national peak body in Australia representing the interests of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and their families. And lastly, we have Therese Edwards, CEO, National Council of Single Mothers and Their Children. Uh, Therese's current work is also with the Australian Women Against Violence Alliance and the Economic Security for Women's Alliance, who also lodged the first complaint that the UN are investigating under the CEDAW Convention regarding single mothers' lack of access of the parenting payment. Therese's organisation also established the 550 Reasons to Smile campaign and petitioned the House of Representatives to maintain and extend the coronavirus supplement. Therese is also fresh from giving evidence to the Family Law Select Committee yesterday. Each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes or so and we'll have time for questions afterwards. So please put your questions in the chat or just signal and I can read them out or pass them over to you to ask your questions directly. This presentation is also recorded and will be available on the Children's Policy Centre website from tomorrow and through, of course, our partners' channels. So please share it with those um, who aren't able to make it here today. I'm now going to turn it over to our first speaker, Professor Sharon Bessel, with her presentation titled titled Addressing Child Poverty. Sharon, over to you. Thanks so much, Angie, and thank you to everyone for joining today. And uh, it is a real privilege to be on this panel with Miranda, Catherine and Therese. Um, I'm speaking from the south of Canberra on Ngunnawal lands, and I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and to acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today. I'm just going to share my screen so um, I can share some slides with you. And I'm assuming that everyone can see that screen and everyone is nodding. So the 2021-22 the budget is a very big spending budget. 
and there has been a preparedness on the part of government to accept a very significant deficit. Mm -hmm. And yet it is not a transformative budget that addresses some of the major structural and systemic issues that are facing Australia. The level of debt being accrued is worrying because those structural and systemic issues are not being addressed. The budget does, that the budget does not address the climate emergency is quite astounding. And of course, if we think about the future that we're creating for our children, this is the most significant issue of intergenerational justice that we're facing. While some elements of the budget, such as the focus on aged care, are welcome, this overall is a problematic budget. There is nothing to seriously address poverty. There is almost nothing for children generally. And where children are considered, the approach is not child-centred. And to bring me to my focus today, there is nothing in the budget to seriously address child poverty. So let me go just a little further in reflecting on some of those silences, particularly around child poverty. So I'm going to assess the budget using the Materials Opportunities Relations Framework or the More for Children Framework. This is a child-centred framework for assessing multidimensional poverty that we've been working on here at the Children's Policy Centre. It's grounded in qualitative research with children using participatory methods to understand what matters most to children. So the framework is made up of three key dimensions. Material deprivation, which is insufficient money and material resources to meet basic needs. Relational deprivation, the existence of structural factors that undermine strong and supportive relationships. And opportunity deprivation, or barriers to being able to participate meaningfully in one's community and to benefit from ongoing development. Of course, deprivation in any one of these dimensions does not necessarily mean poverty, except in the dimension of material deprivation. But where the three dimensions overlap, we see often deep multi-dimensional poverty for children. And it is often multi-dimensional poverty that children experience when they're living in contexts of financial hardship. It's more than the lack of income alone, important as that is. So today, I want to just reflect on the way in which the budget is likely to affect a couple of key themes within each of these dimensions. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's look at two key themes of material deprivation, income and housing. In regard to income, we've seen over the past year a rather remarkable experiment as we all know, with the addition of coronavirus supplements to the income support, around 75,000 children across the country were lifted out of poverty. Research undertaken last year by many organisations, including my colleague Elise Klein here at Crawford, showed what that meant. More nutritious food, access to health care, clothes for children. In some, a range of essential needs could be met. With the removal of the supplements, and the setting of the permanent rate that is below the poverty line, tens of thousands of children were returned to poverty. There was nothing in the budget to address this consequence for children. Modelling by Ben Phillips and others here at the ANU indicates that a 10% increase or $12 billion in the social security budget would make a substantial difference in reducing poverty and in relieving household financial stress. Now, I think we'd all agree that's a lot of money, but perhaps not so much when put in the context of current spending. And we need an informed and transparent discussion around this. But in essence, the silence in the budget on income support and child poverty is a clear policy choice. We have chosen not to address child poverty. While the budget was silent on income support, the government announced support for about 10,000 single parents to buy into the housing market with a 2% deposit. But of course, this is little comfort to the high proportion of single parents, particularly women living in poverty, for whom soaring housing prices keep home ownership out of reach and saving even a 2% deposit is an impossibility. And there was no investment in social housing. 
In sum, in regard to the material basics of adequate housing or of adequate income and housing security, the budget fails to address the urgent needs of children in families experiencing poverty. And let me turn just to the, the idea of opportunity deprivation and to learning, development and community participation. Childcare was a major focus of the budget announcements and for many families, the additional subsidies will be welcome, despite them only being available when two or more children are in childcare. The approach, however, is not child-centred. Rather, the emphasis is on encouraging women's labour force participation. And of course, enabling parents, female or male, to engage in paid employment is critical. And it's also important for addressing child poverty. But this should not be confused with measures that focus on the nature and the quality of childcare and the experience for children. For too long in Australia, childcare has been discussed primarily as a, labor, as a labor market issue, or more worryingly, a women's issue. And I expect Miranda may talk a bit more about that. Yet childcare is a major social policy issue and one that impacts on the daily lives of our younger citizens. Three factors are essential to consider in a child-centered approach to childcare. First, high quality, inclusive, early childhood care and development experiences for all children who are in attendance. Second, well-trained, valued and well-remunerated staff. And third, access for all families, particularly those who are struggling with poverty. The budget fails to address the first two requirements and does not adequately meet the third. For children and young people of school age, if we think beyond childcare to the school where children spend most of their lives, we see very little in the budget. There is increased funding to, uh, for, to support preschool attendance and relatively little, limited funding for schools. But the budget fails to substantially address either equity or outcomes, which are major issues facing the Australian education system and that we have been grappling with and debating for far too long in Australia without substantive action. The research that underpins the framework that I'm using in, in that research, children talked about the importance of taking part in their communities and how poverty prevents them from doing that through lack of income, lack of networks and through stigma. The budget offered little support to children's community participation, but the ongoing and now well entrenched narrative that stigmatizes recipients of social security impacts negatively on children's sense of place within their communities and may well deepen the existing barriers. And finally, it is this dimension, it is this dimension that focuses on relationships within families and, more, and, and relationships more broadly that was of the greatest importance to children. And this has been so in all research that I've done. Children talk about relationships with their families. So what can the budget do to support or to undermine relationships? In our research with children aged between seven and 12 years, they describe the ways in which financial stress, unemployment and underemployment and precarious work impacted negatively on their time and their relationships with their parents. In deciding not to use the budget to address social security or low wage growth or housing stress, and by failing to understand how these issues impact on children, an important opportunity is missed once again to support children and to support their parents when they are living in poverty. While the government has ended the requirement that recipients of sole parenting benefits provide third party verification that they're not in a relationship, sole parenting payments uh, end when a child turns eight, the number of jobs that must be sought each month has increased, and the scrutiny associated with welfare conditionality places, places additional pressures on families. And this impacts on children's lives every day and has been ignored in the budget process. Turning this around requires recognition of the enormous value of care to children, their families and communities and preparedness to invest in it. So finally, to just sum up, I would say that globally, there's been very important work done around children's budgeting, whereby budgets are designed to be both child inclusive and child responsive. 
These initiatives recognise that while children have diverse rights and needs, those rights and needs are often distinct from those of adults, including their parents. It's time for Australia to consider the benefits of assessing budgeting on particular social groups, including children, and especially children who are growing up in poverty. It's also time for Australia to take, urgent, to take the urgent issue of ending child poverty far more seriously in budgeting and in policy priorities more broadly. The failure of the budget, I would suggest to address the structural issues that create poverty or to provide support for children growing up in poverty will have devastating consequences for those children now and in the future. Using a child-centred framework like the one that I've used today provides one means of taking the steps needed to very significantly reduce child poverty in this very wealthy country. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Um, thank you also for shining a light on where the budget is falling short of our, for our children. I'm now going to pass straight on to Miranda, remembering that we'll have questions um, and a bit of discussion at the end. Thanks, Miranda. Thank you. Um, I have uh, some slides to share as well. So let me just check that that um, is working. Um, you can see that? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Uh, so I, I certainly um, support and agree uh, the, with the remarks of Sharon, especially uh, about uh, the inadequacy of job seeker and uh, the impoverishment effects of shifting sole parents off the higher parenting payment onto job seeker once children turn eight. Uh, I should say, first of all, um, hi everyone, and I'm speaking to you from, uh, to pay my respects to the, the the traditional owners of the lands of the Wurundjeri people in the Kulin Nation here in Melbourne uh, and um, pay my respect to their elders uh, past, present and emerging. Uh, so what I would like to focus on um, is this issue of the relationship, I suppose, between uh, child and family poverty and the economic and social uh, position of women. Um, and perhaps also make some remarks about the overall fiscal uh, position of the budget, uh, which was raised, uh, referred to already by Sharon, uh, the size of the fiscal deficit and the policy choices that we can see in the budget. Um, and I do agree with Sharon that there are some choices made in this budget that uh, ignore or prioritise, ignore child poverty issues, um, take a step backwards even, um, or and prioritise other, other interests. Uh, I guess budgets are about uh, making choices uh, and allocating priorities, even big spending budgets. Um, so what I want to emphasise is that uh, to, ta to tackle child and family poverty, what we need to do is look inside that family. And we do that, of course, when we talk about children, but in particular, we need to uh, look at um, women and men inside families. Obviously, in sole parent families, uh, we, we have a, a much clearer idea of who, who that adult is or multiple adults and what um, gender they are uh, and the fact that that is predominantly female headed households still. But we, we have a tendency when we talk about couple families, including low income couple families, still to uh, to fail to see uh, the, the intra-family uh, economic and care um, bargain a relationship that happens and the way that that intersects with policy, including uh, in the budget. So we need to look inside the family to identify that distribution of care time and work and that distribution of economic income. Uh, and we need to focus on the individual. Uh, so the individual woman, whilst recognising and individual children, whilst recognising their context, right, family care and social context. Uh, so I, I am a quite a fan of the capabilities approach to thinking about tax and welfare and government policy more generally. Uh, it's quite consistent, I think, with the approach that Sharon has recommended, although she emphasises the child-centred nature of that approach. But here the idea would be that we need to be looking for um, 
uh, advancing life course, thinking over the life course uh, of all individuals uh, in their family context and ensuring that uh, they have the capacity, capability to do and to be, uh, you know, all that they can. Um, so it's a, a life course approach over time. Um, and that does, uh, as some policies that are about uh, addressing child poverty also have significant impacts on women. And sometimes I think this is seen as a bit of a competition that, you know, for example, in order to, to deliver proper care for children, um, we need to have women in the home it might be a more, you know, one, one approach in order to that, that, that funding for women to be in the workforce is, is potentially at the expense of children. Um, so what we'd be looking for here is um, we need to consider these intersecting uh, individual needs uh, and we're looking for positive reinforcement. We're looking for policies that balance and mutually support well-being of women and children in the household. So you could consider this with respect to a range of policies that are specifically or largely about caring for children, where we see that really strong uh, interaction. I've given some examples there. Um, so I did want to then say something about the women's budget statement. So it is very interesting to see that we do have this women's budget statement reinstated in the budget. Uh, it was removed from the budget uh, by Tony Abbott under the Abbott government in 2014. Now, the, the, the statement, you know, sometimes might end up being a bit of a a bit of a propaganda list, a little bit of a policy summary. Um, I must say, I think that this women's budget statement does uh, repay some careful reading. I don't know if the audience has done it yet. Uh, I certainly wouldn't say it's it's perfect. Uh, in fact, I think a key thing it lacks is actually indicators and targets. Uh, with that goal for gender equality. But having said that, my guess, and I don't know, I don't have any inside knowledge, uh, is that uh, it, 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 because of sort of all the media controversy, the, the clumsy handling of sexual violence and harassment issues in parliament, uh, the, the, the issues about uh, the, 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 the budget response last year to COVID-19, uh, uh, the government did a bit of a U-turn. Uh, it's not clear to me that they ever really intended to reinstate this women's budget statement and yet here it is. And my guess is that internally in the Office for Women and elsewhere, a lot of work was done in a short period of time to put this statement together. Uh, so it's something that needs positive engagement and constructive feedback from all sectors, uh, including um, those working with low income uh, women and children uh, to support its continuation and improvement next Next year. And one of the things I think the women's budget statement does lack is some emphasis on women uh, who are low income and children who are low income. So, uh, you know, policy to actually improve uh, that position. Um, I did want to just highlight a couple of other examples of uh, just to, to give you some alternatives. So Canada has been doing this, this uh, gender budget analysis um, for the last three years, uh, three to four years. They have legislated it uh, in the Gender Budgeting Act and they do it across government. Now, again, I don't want to idealise any government approach. There is always uh, a constructive criticism to be done. But this is a, a, an approach I think that can be useful in tackling child poverty issues as well as women's poverty issues. One of the things Canada does is it does have reporting on targets uh, and data. Okay, so coming back to the Australian budget, um, just a couple of things I think are worth emphasising. Um, it, it is definitely still the case that the job seeker, of course, is, is inadequate, is not um, is, is not covering uh, enough of household uh, incomes and so on. One thing to, to observe is that um, the trends in, in job seeker are uh, becoming more and more gendered. Um, and we're seeing more and more women on job seeker over time. And gender analysis can demonstrate this and that will help us understand uh, the impact on children in poverty as well. Um, so uh, women are becoming much more reliant on this payment. So it, it does seem really important that we should move uh, 
towards uh, expanding payments for children. Um, what that probably means is not so much in, in Job Seeker itself, but considering a reform of family tax benefit AMB uh, and the way that those payments to children are made um, to families with children. The other uh, aspect that I wanted to just uh, say a little bit about in the time now uh, is about uh, childcare. I'm sorry, I'm looking at two screens here, so I'm looking backwards and forwards. Um, uh, and to emphasise the importance of um, unpaid care work and paid employment. I think there's no doubt that uh, many low income households would be made better off uh, if women were enabled and supported to work more in the, the market to earn an income with quality care supporting them. And so childcare, as Sharon said, it's just one piece of the puzzle and economic security is just one piece. Uh, but we really do need to do a bit more work about childcare and COVID, um, uh, in COVID unpaid care work sort of did uh, increase for women and paid work did decrease more than for men. Um, so, you know, we have the, uh, we still have really a relatively small proportion of children in formal care. This stat comes from the women's budget statement, this chart, and from ABS statistics. It's probably combined still only uh, about half of children in some sort of formal care. Uh, informal care, especially from grandparents, uh, grandmas, uh, is still really important. So when we think about caring for, for children, especially in lower income households, we need to look more broadly at the family as well. Uh, the, the childcare policy that's been announced, the current subsidy uh, tightly means tested uh, and capped. And Australia does have very high out-of-pocket childcare costs relative to other countries. Uh, I might point out Canada, we're now looking at about 6% uh, out-of-pocket uh, disposable income. In Australia, it can be up to 25%. Um, the expansion proposal really does not properly address this. It will assist some low-income families, uh, but it doesn't uh, fully solve the problem. Um, we still have workforce disincentive effects, which uh, I won't go into. One thing I did want to mention that is a positive story is the the, the, the permanent uh, commitment to preschool funding, universal preschool, um, which is an important measure that's been rolling from year to year for the last few years. Um, conscious of time, the last thing I did think I would highlight is the fiscal position and the policy choice about income tax cuts, which I guess uh, many people have um, would be aware of. Um, so this is our fiscal balance. Um, uh, as, as Sharon said, uh, we're, we're in substantial fiscal deficit. We've got spending and of course lower revenues, but this for the next decade, right, we are in deficit. In fact, there is no uh, balance in the foreseeable future. Uh, in the budget. And um, at the same time, we still have baked into policy uh, the stage three income tax cuts. So just very briefly, the extension of Lomito this year for one additional year, the fiscal cost is 7.8 billion in a year, uh, per year. Um, the, the estimated annual cost of the, the, the next stage of the tax cut is minimum 17 billion a year. Um, to give you a comparison, the estimated cost of universal childcare is about 12 billion a year. So these are these are big numbers, um, but the dollars um, are, the dollars of the fiscal deficit um, are around about um, uh, currently 106 billion and then 57 billion. So you can sort of see that what's contributing to that deficit is those costs. Uh, so we are making policy choices uh, and I, I think there is a need for a, a, um, a redirection, I guess, of policy uh, with a gender lens uh, and a child lens, which uh, Sharon has suggested. Thanks for that, Angie. Thanks so much, Miranda. Um, really valuable frameworks um, and such huge numbers. It's very stark when you see it like that. Thank you so much. I'm now just going to pass straight over to Catherine. Thanks, Catherine.
All right, hello. How is everyone? Um, obviously, um, I'm actually not in my office at the moment. I've, I've managed to borrow a desk at Westpac of all places. Anyhow, <laughs> I'm thankful for that, but uh, it means I'm off country. And uh, so uh, being an Aboriginal person from Central Australia, it's very important for me to acknowledge that I'm on the land uh, of the Gadigal people uh, sitting here on the Sydney Harbour. So very, very lucky to be here. Um, and of course, a very um, grateful of the opportunity really for, for speak for SNAKE to, to have a voice. Um, in case you're not familiar with who our organisation is, SNAKE is the national voice of our children. We're the national peak body for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people. We work closely with our member organisations to represent the interests of our children and families. Um, the majority of our, of our children are actually thriving. You know, some, they're, do, they're doing well. They're happy and they're healthy and they're strong and they're connected to culture through their families and communities. But what we know from reports and data that comes out year upon year, and we, we see a lot of these things, still a large proportion of our kids don't share the equal opportunity that non-Indigenous children do. Many of our child communities are affected by a range of adverse experiences from poverty through to violence, drug and alcohol issues and homelessness. We know that these issues have resulted from colonisation, from discriminatory government policies and budgets, um, from forced removal and resulting intergenerational trauma. It's very important to understand that these adverse experiences aren't part of our culture. They are the impact of these changes. Um, without an opportunity to support our, our families and communities to heal from that trauma, our children's opportunities throughout life were impacted. And we see this in high levels of engagement in the tertiary system, like child protection and youth justice. And those impacts carry across generations. We need urgent action to support better outcomes and opportunities for our kids. We know that household income and access to safe and healthy housing have a substantial impact on the capacity of families to provide safe and supportive care for children. Nearly one in three or 31.4% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are living below the poverty line. Rental stress defined as paying more than 30% of household income on rent payments is one measurement used to assess affordability. The 2016 census determined that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander householders are almost twice as likely to experience rental stress. Our children are behind in developmental outcomes. They are 2.5 times more likely to be developmentally vulnerable in two or more domains by age of five, and only 35% are considered to be developmentally on track in all five domains against the Australian Early Development Census um, as compared to non-Indigenous children. Through the Closing the Gap target, we want to see at least 55% of our children reach these milestones by 2031. And that's not an easy task. Our children are also 11 times more likely to be in out-of-home care than non-Indigenous children. And this rate without urgent action is expected to double by 2029 we need to take urgent action. This is why the Australian governments and coalition of peaks have committed to working together through the national agreement on closing the gap to ensure all of our children are ready for school by age five and that they can grow up strong and connected to family and culture. The budget includes important new measures for our children and families, including increased investment in early childhood education and care, keeping women and children safe, mental health and suicide prevention, and increased support for victims and survivors of child sexual abuse, but it doesn't go nearly far enough to support families in a number of areas. Specific initiatives for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, as well as initiatives to build the community controlled sector, lack any detail in the budget. However, we do understand that some of these may be seen soon when the closing the gap implementation plans are completed mid year. So for us, this year's budget is very much still wait and see. As you would know, there is major new investment in childcare, the promise of increased subsidies for families with two or more children in childcare, as we've heard, will help make early education more affordable and accessible for many families. But we know that supporting children in those early years offers the best opportunity for proving, improving outcomes across their life. And the way it's structured now doesn't quite hit those most vulnerable children. As we've heard, it's designed for working families and what we need is something different. So we need to see significant change if we have to have any hope in achieving our target in closing the gap, and that is to increase our children, um, those to increase our children developmentally on track to 55% by 2031. 
It's a big target and they've all signed up to it. The current childcare system is a one size fits all approach and it doesn't benefit our children and our families. We need to remove barriers for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children to accessing early education. That includes scrapping the activity test that limits children's participation in childcare when their parents don't meet minimum work and study requirements and provide at least 30 hours of a week of free or 95% subsidised childcare. And this comes down to a purpose. So at this, as we've heard, the purpose at this moment in time is to enable women, primarily women, to engage in the workforce. The purpose for early education for our mob is something very different and that's about ensuring our children have the best start in life. We need investment into holistic Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community controlled early year services that provide culturally safe services and address the family's broader needs, offering wraparound, wraparound holistic services. Many of the fantastic Aboriginal children and family centres and multifunction Aboriginal children services across the country are already doing an incredible job of this and yet we continue to look for overseas solutions. They have been successful to engage and support families that otherwise wouldn't be able to access um, or been successful um, to support families otherwise. They are constantly telling us that the childcare funding model is making it hard for them to do it when and to offer the support that families need and that it is putting barriers in the way of Aboriginal families getting the support they need. In fact, one of the services we were talking to this morning was telling us that when the activity test was brought in, their numbers dropped to only eight. When, those, when the activity test was scrapped for that interim period during COVID, their numbers went through the roof. Nearly every child of age in that community accessed early childhood education and care. During the COVID-19 um, pandemic, we saw something different and that is that people were actually able to access early education. When those barriers were removed, they took advantage of it. We need to learn from this and we need to make that change. There is new investment in the budget for family violence prevention, as we've mentioned, and while that's very welcome, there must be broader investment in prevention and early intervention focused family services to address the rising rate of over-representation over of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in out-of-home care. At this moment in time, only 16% of the 6.9 billion investment in child protection systems is spent on supporting families. Okay, so that's supporting families to be able to work with their children, work with the system and to stop being put into the pipeline. This proportion has remained constant over the past three financial years. This is just not good enough. While it is amazing that we have new high level agreements through closing the gap, the ongoing failure to support our families and heal trauma for our communities is a national disgrace. It is well past time for governments to put these agreements into action, and we will be working to keep them account accountable through the Coalition of Peaks and the Closing the Gap Framework. We know what the solutions are, and we've already seen some of those benefits, and we hope you can help us in joining to help these agreements get into action. The truth of the matter is, at this moment in time, our kids can't wait. Thank you. Thanks so much, Catherine. Um, you so clearly articulated what is needed, the solutions are out there, and still it's falling short. So we really look forward with you to, um, to hearing what is coming up in those closing the gap measures. Thanks. Um, I'm now going to pass to our final speaker, Therese Edwards. Thanks, Therese. Thank you and thanks for staying with us and also letting me be the last speaker because um, I just figured that there were so many talented women that could do that economic analysis. I could do a little bit more of that sort of the, the behind the scenes. So first of all, thanks Angie. And I am um, speaking to you from Ghana, from the Ghana land and I know that I'm just a visitor. So I do walk with care and with respect um, across those Adelaide plains. So um, everyone, I had my flight booked and went it off, trotted off to Canberra from, from Adelaide with a bit of hope, with a bit of wow in my heart. We've just been told that we've had the, um, the family home guarantee that, that Sharon had spoken to you about. and and. I, I was more positive about this than a lot of my colleagues 
And when I did an analysis of myself, why I was feeling positive, I realized because it was the first time in a long time that single mothers wasn't spoken about in a punitive manner and that there wasn't something taken away. So the federal budget is a, a place of disappointment and harm for us. So it was really nice to, nice to start off on that front foot. So, so that was super positive. So a little bit about that um, policy background is, I'm not sure how much influence we had, but I was lobbied by some single mums picture to what's been painted, um, mature, they describe themselves as mature women that have always um, been able to straddle paid work and unpaid care and had a little bit of money um, put aside, not, not enough for what was required for a home deposit, but were trapped in that really high paying um, private rental market. And so they said, what can you do? What are your thoughts? What, what, can, what, what can we actually do? So I thought it was powerful just to collect those absolute um, vignettes. And then, and then I could um, put them in a letter. And we had a meeting with, the minister, with Senator Hume, who then became the Minister for Women's Economic Security. So I spoke to her in that context. And we had a couple of... Um, advisors lobby lob into that through soon from Minister Rustin's office. So really I should have tweaked that something was happening because I, I normally don't have five advisors and a couple of ministers at, at my um, request. So I have, how I've painted that is that we put a, a boundary around that, that we just use it as um, a conversation starter an entree into the Women's Summit and to bring some of those fantastic folk that know housing and social housing and with a gender lens really well. So I'm, I'm hoping that that's where, where that journey will take us. So on the side of the investment, um, the National Council Single Mothers and Their Children, led by myself, we went to the federal budget without financial fairness, without financial security, and with, without financial safety, and we came home with those missing as well. So that there was not an investment in us or other low income women. Uh, we did certainly did do our pre-budget submission, and this won't be a surprise to anyone. What we do want most, mostly, is to ensure that women who um, have a child of eight years or older can access the parent payment single, as you all know from our previous speakers and probably from people who have heard me wax lyrical, is that it, it really hurts my heart every time a mum who has a child that turns eight feels that absolute horror and is chucked onto the unemployment benefit and it completely denigrates that she's already doing a damn good job and probably the biggest and most critical job and a full-time job, which is raising her, her children. So we want that restored and then we want a 20% increase to, um, to payment. So I'm calling it a down payment in respect. And then let's get really serious about what we need because um, the payments that the single mother benefit was not part of the harm mm. review. And so we haven't had um, any sort of scrutiny or interrogation of what families need to be able to afford those basics. We were also pretty staggered um, that child support still missing in action policy. Um, and for those who um, follow politics, it was a willing discussion yesterday between myself and uh, two other fantastic members of my team and we um, we raised the matter of child child support and we have an airbrush figure of a 1.6 billion child support debt and just for those people who are concerned about child poverty if child support is paid on time and in full it has the capacity to reduce um, child poverty by 21 percent but we do have some wins 
And I want to talk about that win in particular, and Sharon has, has touched on it, but it's a third party verification. And I'm going to ask Cecilia if she'd be kind enough to put up a picture of um, Elizabeth. So bear with me as I read Elizabeth's statement. So this is Elizabeth Clark. Elizabeth wrote to me in April of 2019, and she said, I'm sitting in a center link queue, waiting to give them a form, proving that I'm not in a relationship, or I risk having my meager pension cut off. And it's giving me the opportunity to reflect because I'll either weep with despair or say something. So tomorrow, it's two years since I became a single parent. It's changed me in all sorts of ways. I'm tougher, stronger, smarter, more hardworking, and more sleep deprived. It has forced me to get uncomfortable, to look inward and to get to know myself intimately. I'm a lot better asking for help. I'm also politicized made, and, and I'm made to feel angry. So I'm using this opportunity. I'm angry for my dear friend who has to verify my relationship status. And no doubt she'll receive a phone call mm. demanding proof that I'm not secretly living with a partner. I know that Centrelink will have the right to investigate me further and even come to my house. I'm angry that I'm sitting here feeling guilty, even though I've done nothing wrong. I'm, I'm angry at the assumptions that because I need welfare, that I'm lying, that I'm lazy, that I can't keep a relationship together and I can't get a good job. I should just try harder. I'm angry that I have actually chosen to stay at home with our young children and work from home. I'm angry that it's overwhelmingly women and children who are forced to live in poverty. And I'm angry that in Australia, women are still murdered at the hands of men. I'm just shedding tears sitting in the Centrelink office. I'm angry about this form. So I, um, we, there was a great article that spoke about that, that you know that the meaning cracked down on single mums and that third party verification has happened so i scrolled back through nearly three years of messages and i found that link and i sent it to, to elizabeth and i said this one's for you hun and sent a couple of um red love hearts with it and we started to talk and it was very powerful and I still get a bit emotional and I asked Elizabeth for, in preparation for today could I actually um, read out her statement and show her picture and so that's what we're doing to these beautiful 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 women I'd also like to share a picture with you of a really good mate of mine Angela some of you may have met Angela before she has many talents um, and one of them is she, she heads up her own family. So on the budget, uh, Angela did appear and open up her house to 7.30 report. Um, she was ready to make those killer statements and put her intellect on display. But she described to me that night when I checked in with her that she was feeling defeated. And on Sunday, we had a chance for a more comprehensive conversation. And she was defeated because a broadcast that we, we both trusted in framed her as just pictorial to dialogue. And then her, her killer statements were not picked up. Her intellect was not on display. But then we all had to suffer the ABC, and I don't know if there's anyone on the ABC here, but I hope you are. We then all had to pick up on the ABC saying that there was something in this budget for everyone. It just made us feel more invisible. So my final bit that I want to talk about outside of the financial investment is the framing and the messaging and how important it is for us for you to get this right. So, um, I am asking everyone here, please stop using the phrase jobless families. Um, we, we seem as a collective, as a powerful group in that, that sort of, you know, 
come from a, a feminist background to women's study, to women's community and the community sector, we seem to get a bit antsy and a bit moralistic in a superior way when our most disliked media um, frame us in a bad way, yet we feed into it. So when you hear that, you know, it's jobless families that struggle the most, Mr. and Mrs. Community will go, well, then why don't you just get a job? So I need to, I need to let you know that I'm really fed up that I have to actually say that. And so I'm calling upon you to, to stand with us and to be part of the solution rather than the, the continuation of that, um, of that horror show. Um, the last thing I'd like to do is just share a quick collage from our 550 Reasons to Smile. Um, these were what I wanted to show, and I think Catherine um, touched on this, when we could see what happened when we actually had that investment and when we set up processes that, that people want to engage upon. So all of these pictures that are before you, the, um, everyone self-loaded those, those pictures and described it themselves. I didn't have to hunt for it. So what I had was a campaign that, that was um, underpinned by uh, self-direction, a platform to give people who had not had a voice before and they could direct and lead it. So my ambition, so when I was thinking about the federal budget and our degree of invisibility, it just made me think that there is so much work to do. So I feel positive that we have some platforms ahead of us, such as the Women's Summit and the um, Women's Economic Task Force, which I'm hoping to have a spot. Um, and so I'll be agitating from, I've already started my agitating, but what I would love the most, what our ambition is, and it, um, the federal budget brought it home for me, is that I really want to establish a campaign which is led by single mums, which gives voice to single mums, that allows some of that myth-busting um, process to occur, that can provide that contemporary statistics, and that can provide um, an opportunity for all to be engaged. So in a nutshell, my reflections was that um, single mums and low income women remain invisible. So we've still got a lot of work to do. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Therese. Um, thank you also for sharing those powerful words from those women and their lived experience. Couldn't agree with you more about um, the phrasing and, um, you know, the punitive and deficit language um, and it's incumbent really on all of us to, to think about the words um, we choose to use and um, be aware of that need to shift from individual responsibility and blaming language to be able to understand and assess these structural um, impositions that happen to families and their children. I think um, we're just about out of time, but I did want to hand it over um, just to our other panellists, um, Tony Wren, Anti-Poverty Week, Emma Sydney Ham, Social Ventures Australia, Dina Bowman from Brotherhood of St. Lawrence. Just if you wanted to have a quick final word. Hi, it's Tony here from Anti-Poverty Week. I just wanted to thank everyone for their great contributions. I think that from our perspective, what we saw last year was some incredible progress on ending poverty. And we know we've got the solutions, we know we can do it for children as well. Over one in five children are actually, um, were able to be um, supported through the coronavirus supplement. Um, there's much more to do. And um, I'm committed with our network to, to focus on this issue going forward. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Tony. I might jump in there. Um, thanks, Tony. Yeah, I think what our speakers really pointed out is that the policies that affect parents affect children. And the budget was a really missed opportunity to invest in, in children and families, and importantly, in the conditions that enable families to care for their children. And so we'll be working, continue to work hard 
around creating those enabling conditions so everyone can live uh, with dignity. Thanks, Dina. All right. Well, we might um, bring this to a close right on two o'clock. Thank you so much to our speakers. Um, you've given us so much to think about. There's been some progress and you've charted a way and a vision, I think, a transformative vision for our families and our children. So thank you so much to our speakers. Just to say also that this session um, has been recorded and will be available on our website and through our partners channels. Thank you so much, everybody.